Welcome everyone to the fifth session of the Building Back Better series on tackling race and ethnic inequalities. My name is Antonio Silva. I'm the head of social cohesion at the Behavioral Insights team, and I'll be moderating today's session. I'll be asking a series of questions to our panelists, and at the end, there'll be time for an audience Q&A. Throughout the session, please feel free to add questions using the Q&A function uh, uh, on the bottom of your screen, and I will then select some to ask our panelists. Also, please be aware that the session will be recorded. Before I start, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Maria Sobolewska is a professor of political science and deputy director of the Cassie Marsh Institute for Social Research at the University of Manchester. She writes about race and ethnicity in British politics, from elections to political representation. She's a co-author of the book, The Political Integration of Ethnic Minorities in Britain, and a new book, Brexit Land, Identity, Diversity, and the Reshaping of British Politics, is coming out in October. Our second speaker, Senna Katwala, is the director of British Future, an independent and non-partisan think tank, which works on identity, migration, integration, and race relations. British Future is a founding member of the Together Coalition, working to establish the 2020s as a decade of reconnection in our society beyond the COVID pandemic. And recent major projects include the National Conversation on Immigration, the biggest ever public engagement exercise on immigration and integration in the UK, and Remember Together, a project with the Royal British Legion, which brings people from different backgrounds together to commemorate our shared history. Sender was also previously an Observer Journalist and a General Secretary of the Fabian Society. He's also a member of the Independent Commission for the Counter Extremism Advisory Group. Our third speaker, Trevor Phillips, is a writer and a television producer. He's a co-founder of the data analytics consultancy Weber Phillips and chairman of Green Park and Executive Search. He's also the chairman of the Global Freedom of Expression Campaign Charity Index on Censorship, a senior fellow at the Policy Exchange Think Tank, and a vice president of the Royal Television Society. He was the president of the John Lewis Partnership Council in 2018, and is a founding chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. This session comes at a time that the issue of race and ethnic inequalities are at the forefront of the public discourse. This greater focus started during the COVID pandemic and accelerated with the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, and happened not only in the US, but across the world. In the UK, inequalities between different groups persist across sectors, with growing evidence that discrimination and bias play an important role in driving some of these disparities, particularly in employment. And the COVID-19 pandemic has also highlighted the striking gaps in outcomes and experiences between minority and majority groups. At the same time, the past decades have um, we've seen progress achieved in several areas in ways that have sometimes been overlooked. This ranges from education, where most ethnic minority groups are now outperforming the white majority in educational attainment, to the current government having the most ethnically diverse cabinet ever. In this session, we'll be exploring how we got here, how the pandemic impacted and highlighted inequalities between groups in the UK, and ask why the most effective solutions to tackle these inequalities and create a more cohesive an equal society. In the UK, conversations about social and racial inequalities have historically been more common than in most European countries. Still, this time, it feels like the conversation is shifting and there's a greater goal for change than before. The first question that I'd like to pose to our panelists is whether they think that the conversation will to some extent fade away from the public discourse like has happened before, or do you think this time, will there be a genuine step change in how we tackle these issues? And we can start with Senda for the first question, then Maria and then Trevor. Um, thanks, thanks for the invitation. I think it has been the pattern previously that the discussion about race um, in, in mainstream politics media has been very event driven and has tended to fade, you've had either major political interventions, you know, Roy Jenkins and Enoch Powell, or you've had the riots of 1981, or you've had the impacts of 9-11, um, and, and then it's tended to fade. I think um, a reason for being hopeful you can sustain uh, the pressure more this time is there's a broader sociological uh, thing happening. We're a much more diverse society than, than we were. Um, and so if you're going from 5% of the population to one in six of the population, there's a lot more presence um, and a lot more profile and a lot more voice. And that can be contentious as well, because that change has felt 
very fast for some people, while, you know, change for minorities has felt very slow for minorities themselves, this sense of frustration and fatalism. But I think the increased diversity and the increased normalization of diversity at the top of public and professional life means that it's harder for it to slip off the agenda entirely. It might become more polarized or we might do something constructive with it. I think there's another um, issue about why now that, that perhaps is less prominent. Mm -hmm. This is obviously a generational shift, um, the debate we're having about um, racism now. I think it reflects uh, a rising impatience and higher expectations of the younger group. It's also one of the first times, I think, maybe not the very first time, but the, the race and immigration debates are clearly much more separate. And this summer, race was more salient for society generally than immigration. And that hasn't happened before. It's quite interesting that it's only, you know, it's only a, a decade or so ago that Ipsos Mori actually separated race and immigration as a category. So race and immigration are the same issue when the wind rush arrives. They're the same issue when um, Enoch Powell is saying, send them all back. And I still think in the 80s, right, the Norman Tebbit cricket test, race is a migrant communities issue. And what you have here, I think, is race as an issue in British society for British ethnic minorities. And that's obviously especially true of the younger group. Half of those who are not white in Britain are foreign born, half are British born. But obviously the younger group are predominantly British born. And with, with the first generation, I think you had the phenomenon of migrant optimism. People will put up with a lot, but they hope their kids will get a better chance. And to some extent, it's, a, it's an integration effect that is positive rising educational achievement is rising expectations. It's also, a, in a way, an integration effect that is disruptive, that there is, there is more scepticism, more challenge about how British society is doing on these issues from the children of migrants who have better opportunities than their parents did, but don't have equal opportunities. I think to some extent the Stephen Lawrence occasion was the first time that race was about race in Britain, not about race for migrant communities. But I think Black Lives Matter and those protests are very much about race in Britain. The, the challenging thing about that as well is we've inherited this moment from America, but actually I think we have a very different society from America and we need a very different race debate from America. And it might be that the internet debate, the political debate, imagine we live in Donald Trump's America when we don't. And I think, I think all sides of this debate need to have a debate about the challenges we face in Britain, not necessarily one that we inherit from the States. Thank you, Sandra. Um, Maria? So, uh, since Sunda already mentioned this issue of uh, high expectations of young ethnic minorities and the rising numbers, I think uh, it is worth talking about the second big sociological change that has been happening since the 80s. Um, and it is something that um, uh, we cover extensively in, in the forthcoming book you so kindly mentioned, uh, Antonio. Um, and it is to do with the identities of white people, younger white people. And what we have observed in Britain is that we have an increasing uh, number of young white people for whom it is part of their own self-identity to think that they are racially liberal. Uh, they also have often other liberal views of uh, gender and um, sexuality and generally speaking they perceive themselves. We have this survey question um, asking how important is it for yourself that you are against prejudice and increasing number of people say that it is important to them and I think that particular moment in time when they saw an opportunity to mobilize around uh, this uh, very effective label Black Lives Matter a lot of white younger people came out in support of this as well adding to that momentum driven by uh, British ethnic minorities and I think this is also one of the reasons why we see this constant looking towards the US because of course these uh, young people very often consume news and information about the world um, through social media and social media does not experience this kind of similar boundary so well this is an American person tweeting therefore that's not my reality for them it is their reality uh, and the world in which they live in and I think this is uh, one of the reasons why um, this particular movement has had so much more momentum than other moments of British politics. Uh, for example, like Stephen Lawrence uh, murder that has garnered so much less comparatively speaking uh, support from the white population as well. So our society is changing not just by becoming more diverse, but also 
by becoming uh, much more likely to be populated by people who embrace diversity as a social good. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning actually that one of the big uh, kind of game changers here for me is that um, Brexit, the, the, the wonderful word that is uh, returning onto our news pages uh, again. And I think it plays a role here in, in our discussions of race because before Brexit, what we saw is mobilization of anti-immigrant, uh, racially conservative uh, political movement and people around those political movement. And I think Brexit was a wake up call to all these people who would consider themselves more liberal and an opportunity for them to mobilize around their uh, liberalism. And I think this is, they were ready to mobilize around something more positive, more liberal, more racially uh, kind of open and uh, diverse. And Black Lives Matter therefore was well timed for, for this part of the population. Thank you, Marie. Trent? Trent, can you hear us? Yes, I'm sorry, I, I hadn't unmuted. Um, I think we're going to distinguish between the different conversations of which we might be speaking. It is uncertain, it is undoubtedly true that the elite conversation ebbs and flows and you know sometimes there's a lot about quote unquote race in the newspapers and sometimes there's not and so on um but i think we oughtn't to be uh misguided by this i think that the conversation about racial difference and uh, diversity within society never really fades sometimes uh, amongst people uh, the wider population and sometimes that it that conversation is clothed in terms as an immigration debate. Sometimes it's straightforwardly about discrimination. Uh, in the last four or five years, I think actually uh, it is uh, central to debate about political correctness and wokeness and all of that, though nobody would quite say it's about race, but actually that's in large part what it's about. Or even, um, I suppose, sorry, maybe more tenuously, urban versus rural. So I think the first point I, I want to make is that though the elite conversation spends most of its time trying to suppress any debate about race, I don't think it ever in my lifetime has actually gone away. Secondly, I think um, that both Sandra and Maria are right, that there are objective forces that are uh, making the question of race, racial difference and cultural difference uh, critical to public conversation. Um, part of that, of course, is uh, a thing, as Sander said, um, that in some senses, culturally, we are a colony of the United States. So where for really strong, real objective forces, race is a central dividing line and so on in the United States, we get a pale echo of it simply because of our relationship with the English speaking world. Um, I also think though that there are some differences here and um, perhaps we'll talk a bit about demographics and I just want to at the beginning pick up one specific point which is that um, Britain has a really substantive substantial mixed race community which I think uh, the community population I beg your pardon which I think we don't quite ever understand the significance of which uh, we're talking about something like a million plus people who would claim more dual heritage and that means that actually there are actually rather more millions of families who 40 years ago would not have been related to somebody who's not white who are. And I think that's changing the conversation quite a lot. Then I may just make one last point, um, which I hope we'll talk about more. I would say that there's a more general point about the relationship between econo uh, in politics, between economics and identity and culture. Um, I think in the past, if you think of the politics as a sort of car, it, economics always had it hand on the, on the steering wheel. That's what guided you know, your political choice. I think, and identity and culture was in the passenger seat. I think in the last decade, something has changed that's put uh, identity and culture in the driving seat. And this is not just about race. Think about me too think about we will not be removed. All of these issues are more potent indicators of political and uh, cultural preferences 
than your view, for example, about capitalism. Um, and I think that is pro race, the prominence of race is, uh, in a sense, a feature of that change, which perhaps we can talk about more. Thank you. No, it's fascinating looking at the, the, the role of globalization and cultural globalization in the way the uh, ideas and, and protests uh, spread. Um, and also, I think yeah, the idea of the role of identity, and it's fascinating that this type of um, ideas now, as you said, it's better particular than, for example, left and right traditional axis of, of support or, or against capitalism, which is, I think, somewhat also related to the, the shift with Brexit and this kind of new axis of polarization that we see and how that affects the conversation. Um, I wanted to, to move on to the, 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 the role and the, the aspect of the COVID pandemic and how um, interacted with some of these discussions. And I wanted to, to start by asking, in what ways do you think ethnic minorities have been affected differently by the pandemic? I've been well, I'm suggesting there's some kind of figures about it, but I wanted to see what, from your perspective, what is the kind of the main aspects of, of this differential impact. And um, I can start with Marie this time. Thank you. Um, so this is such a complex area and we have heard a lot about uh, some of these aspects uh, that do mean that minority communities are impacted more. Um, anything from overrepresentation in key worker um, um, occupations and that goes from um, the kind of more professional key worker like NHS workers but also to um, just taxi drivers. So throughout the whole economic spectrum we have an overrepresentation of ethnic minorities in those key worker uh, jobs and of course the key workers couldn't shield as effectively as uh, others and had to go out and keep the society running throughout the pandemic. Um, we have issues around housing and the quality of housing, the density of housing, multi-generational households. So again, this mix of uh, successes uh, such as, uh, you know, better get, getting on, uh, larger families, uh, but also the quality of housing, which is a huge problem. Um, and we have a lot of research about health uh, inequalities and a lot of this research points out that even controlling for poverty, which is a huge theme for a lot of ethnic minorities, um, there is uh, something that appears to be a, a direct penalty uh, of, of discrimination, of prejudice. Um, minorities who experience a lot of discrimination in their daily lives do experience worse health outcomes throughout. And so you would think it's natural that COVID would be one of these uh, as well. But the one thing that I would like to kind of mention here, and that reflects my where I come from in my research, is how little uh, control over a lot of these outcomes ethnic minorities truly have. And I think that has to do with the uh, fact that the power structures in our society, despite all these social changes, are still predominantly run by white people. And this is where I'm going to come back to my uh, main theme of my research, which is political representation. And a lot of what I just mentioned, especially quality of housing, um, are within the remit of local government very often. And what we have seen recently, uh, we published a big report um, as part of the University of Manchester uh, Centre on Dynamics of Ethnicity. Uh, we see a huge underrepresentation in many extremely ethnically diverse areas of this country. And I think uh, the fact that minorities do not have that decision-making power over how they live, over where they live, over the quality of local provisions and, uh, you know, from housing, but even things like access to GPs and distance from GPs, um, this really does impact on their lives and how they experience the pandemic. And I think this is a, a huge area that uh, almost always inevitably gets left out of these discussions of inequalities, that actually the minorities are not put in positions of power, but they could change things uh, for themselves. Um, and I think um, a good example of this is actually how these things have changed on the top. We have seen a lot of uh, government activity into researching why they are ethnic inequalities. And that is, uh, I think, because partly because we have the most ethnically diverse um, the government in history of this country, as you already mentioned, Antonio. So if we had this ethnic diversity throughout all these structures of power, I think we would see a lot more attention uh, on the lower levels of government, trying to figure out how to make those inequalities, health inequalities, better for ethnic minorities throughout 
the power structures. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And Anna? Sorry, you asked, I didn't hear me. Yes. Um, go ahead. Oh, forgive, <laughs> forgive me. I, could, uh, I dropped out for a second. Um, well, look, um, I wanted to move very, very mildly on this um, only because whilst I probably, I think probably overall there is or are differences, um, what I'd say in relation in terms of answering your question about the different responses is that it's very difficult to answer it because we just do not know um, about the impact uh, of COVID. There have been lots of studies done, but actually the, the, the problem is they don't tell us very much. Um, and probably the simplest way to explain what I think about this is to say, uh, when we think about the gaps, we don't know much about the where. We don't know whether there are gaps in levels of infection, as there are, for example, between old and young people, uh, which are different from levels, gap, gaps that there might be in hospitalization, and different again from uh, gaps that are in mortality. And we literally do not know. I mean, I know that I've read all the reports and so on. We literally don't know what's true about that. Secondly, we don't know who, almost all the categories, in, in all the studies rather, that have been done, use categories that are huge. That, for example, compress Caribbean, people of Caribbean background, people of West African background. And that one of the things we actually already know that they are affected in the same way. And the truth is, when you look at the pay data from uh, ONS, we know that there is a 50 point gap between the minorities at the top, Chinese, let's say, and Bangladeshis at the bottom. We don't know if that's reflected in this area or not. Uh, we don't know when, and I think this is very, very important. What the picture was, and we did, um, my company was probably the first to flag this back in mid-March, that there would be some issues and there would be some differences. We are pretty certain that the picture that we saw, that we were able to extract using um, publicly available data in March, would not be the picture today. So I suspect that when we have got through the first wave, it is conceivable, I don't know if this is true, I think it's unlikely, but it's entirely conceivable that what we'll discover is that there is almost no difference in relation to ethnicity. And finally, um, one of the things that we are absolutely certain is that we don't know about the impact of confounding variables, comorbidities, occupation, those kinds of things. We don't, you know, the, 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 it, it's almost inconceivable that Indian doctors who live in Harrow are the same as Pakistani heritage taxi drivers who live in Blackburn. So my, my main point about this issue about gaps and so on and the impact, differential impact on minorities is that we just don't know. For example, and there's a very, very big concrete example, we don't know, um, and because nobody's asked and there's no data about this, uh, if there's a big, diff big impact on Filipinos. I, I find it hard to believe that there won't be but we just don't know. Um, and if I can make one f last point about what happens going forward, um, I think what is perhaps more important now is to think about the, the impact of COVID on areas in general, which may have a disproportionate impact on some ethnic minorities. So for example, we know that retail will not be the same next year, and that will have a disproportionate effect on some ethnic minority groups who are uh, in big numbers, work in big numbers in retail. We know that IT, uh, the, the, the move towards I, um, IT, uh, employment in digital technology and so on, is going to be accelerated. And from what we've seen in the past, that shuts out not all minorities, but some minorities. And I think that may be a more useful way to think about these gaps. What are... Uh, um, is going to be the differential impact of trends that we already know are going to take place. Thank you, Trevor. Um, and now, Sim. I, I think Trevor makes an important point. It's quite surprising, I think, now in September, 
how little we know about the why um, or even about the, the scale of these impacts, which, which is strange because this was a very salient issue quite quickly, I think, in, in April, April, May, um, early, early in COVID. I think, I think it was realised to be quite a significant issue quite early. Partly it, it talks about that that's evidence of the value of having ethnic data and ethnic data is something you collect. So I think in the United Kingdom and the United States, it was spotted. And then there was a political salience and a public policy salience and a health professional salience that this was important. Um, I think in countries that tend not to collect ethnic data or connect proxies, you know, there are almost certainly some ethnic diversities going on in Scandinavia, in France and in Germany, but there's a long way behind really knowing it's the case. So, so we knew there was something quite striking there and that's quite important for one of our big public policy debates, which is, you know, is race inequality something in the past? It was a shame, but it's over now. Is it with us today? Well, this, this seemed like strong evidence that, you know, race inequality can be a matter of life and death. And so you want to know what can be done about it in COVID during the pandemic, and what are the broader lessons of the underlying social determinants of health inequalities? And there, I think it's surprising we haven't got very far you know there's very strong technocratic data that crunches this way and that but i don't think we sorted out how much is social class doing how much is income doing how much is occupational patterns doing frontline work how much of it is geography and is that geography significant or is that geography coincidental so obviously i'm not a health expert or a scientific expert but as a generalist person interested in race inequalities it'd be really important to know about this and to some extent the studies have kept repeating what we know there were correlations that haven't really explained it and so different there's a tendency in all of our race debates that people just say what they always think so if you're on the broad mainstream left you will just say well this is economic inequality and social housing and social determinants and other people say this might be behavioral or this might be genetic but i haven't really seen an effort to work out what is going on and that that might have some quite important short-term impacts whether short-term things we could be doing you know should um, older Asian doctors be told to be more cautious about going back should, should vitamin D being used and it's important to explore these broader issues you know has has this impacted um, you know more affluent minorities as well as less affluent minorities and what does that tell us about whether it's community contact intergenerational living socioeconomic so I still think if we pay more attention to what we find out over time we'll we'll illuminate some broader themes we need to know about but I think it's a bit disappointing in a way that that we haven't yet got good explanations on this. Can I just come in very quickly to say that as a kind of representative of academia more broadly that uh, this research is probably happening it's just that the data is quite new and I know the main funding bodies uh, in the UK have made quite a lot of investments in in that kind of COVID uh, analysis and research so I think this research is probably being done and will come soon hopefully but uh, when academics say soon they don't mean the same thing as uh, newspaper um, people and others so soon in academic terms can i add a, a, a point here uh, i tell you i think sandra's point is absolutely profound and um uh, well uh, let, let me be absolutely clear the truth is that actually uh, the, the reason we don't know is that nobody wanted to know one of the arguments that was made right at the very beginning of this when we raised this uh, by some people who became prominent in arguing you know minorities were affected later they made this argument in may june what they were saying in march and april was we didn't want to pick out minorities because that would stigmatize communities and actually i can tell you for i can tell you with absolute certainty because i was there some public health agencies specifically avoided doing any research in this for that reason. Now, my view is that this was near criminal. And I'll give you a very simple example. My business partner, who is white and over 70, has been shielding for six months uh, because actually this is a prob probabilistic exercise. And he's shielding because the probability for him is high, uh, of risk for him is high. I'm not shielding, actually, because theoretically, I'm under 70, not far under, but under 70, and therefore my risk is theoretically lower. I will bet money that when we actually get to the end of this, what we will discover is that my ethnicity elevated my total risk profile above his. 
But we don't know that because we didn't investigate it and we didn't look for it, and that was deliberate. And I'll say that we are still doing exactly the same thing today. I have opened the papers this morning and I look at the list of hotspots, Leicester, Blackburn, Oldham, Burnley. Now, in any other world, that would be telling you something really, really important. I would like somebody to show me where anybody has raised the flag about that. And that's because we don't want to know. And frankly, I think that the science, I, I, I hope what Maria says is true, but I have to tell you, I get to see quite a lot for various other reasons of what is being commissioned. And there isn't any of this. Literally, there's none of this. So can I just make um, almost a question whether, Trevor, you think that does reflect the lack of representation of ethnic minorities no. in those public health bodies? Or do you think the minorities no. there also kind of reject that? No, I think, no, I think it's a point that, uh, in, in a way that Sander made, that everybody wants a narrative. Everybody has come to this with a narrative. And part of the narrative is that minorities as a whole have been disadvantaged. And anything that might question that becomes a problem. So actually, we don't commission work that might question it. Now, I think actually, I, from what I've seen, I think the reality is that some minorities will have been clearly massively disadvantaged. Others will be in the other direction. But I think that the, the, the strength of the, if you like, the political narrative is such that it is making it impermissible to investigate anything that might challenge that narrative. And as I say, I think this is a near criminal mm. issue, which I think, um, not immediately, but sometime next year, I suspect some people will be very, very ashamed of what they've done. Mm. Can I just add yeah. a footnote to this, Antonio? Um, just at a general public level in the north of England, there is the general perception, we've been doing some deliberative research that general perception that the local lockdowns, the timing was very much about Eid and mm. about Muslim communities, but the governments didn't want to say so. And some people among the white British, I mean, there's some uh, frustration about that among Asian communities. Among the white British, you know, there's some fear it will be divisive or it will blame people. There's quite a lot of sympathy actually towards Muslim communities that, you know, if things had happened on Christmas Eve, you know, we'd have found it difficult, but maybe that was a reason to do it. But there's a perception that the government thought that, but felt it was important not to say it. And there, I think this, you know, goes, goes to Trevor's point, it's important to investigate, but if that is a reason, it's incredibly important to say it. There can be a sympathetic way to say it. We're very sorry, but actually more contact now in intergenerational families will be difficult, so we know how disruptive that will be. But to pretend there was nothing to do with it, but it had to be done at 10 p.m. that night, Nobody believes that, and that, that is quite corrosive of public trust if that is part of the reasoning that you can't say so. And so I think, on the whole, transparency is incredibly important in a pandemic, and it's in the interests of the minority community. So I think we have to get past what, what Trevor's picking up as a, you know, uh, an inhibition towards actually exploring the facts. No, that's, that's a very interesting point of the, of the lack of transparency and in relation to the, the fear of being able to explicitly say this is about heat and about uh, people moving from household to household. For example, in Portugal, where I come from, lockdown was instituted a day before Easter because, very openly, because to prevent people from traveling to, to their families, it was kind of very openly um, said and, and understood. Um, but here that, there's that, uh, there was that lack of transparency that I think um, drove some of this uh, lack of trust. I think one of the, the I think main points that I think all you three mentioned is that because we don't have the kind of robust research or, or the, the data available, in a sense, there's inequalities or perceived inequalities in a sense like a Rorschach ink blot. We kind of each ideology sees what they want to see um, in, in this inequality, whether from the, the right and the left, and, and this will probably continue until we have better research. Now, moving on, still in relation to the pandemic, but trying to think of perhaps some of the positive sides. We, we saw during the lock, during lockdown some interesting phenomena that perhaps um, hints at a more cohesive society than some of us may, may have anticipated. And we've got things like Captain Tom's Backyard Marathon and the weekly Thursday clapping for the NHS workers. And I wanted to ask, in terms of broader social cohesion, what do you think were the main positive and negative impacts of COVID-19 um, and the lockdown? 
And um, I can start with Trevor this time. Um, well, I think it's possible to overstate the sort of um, social psychology of this. Uh, I mean, Sanders more than ex is the expert on on this, and British Future's done a lot of work on the extent to which people, um, you know, feel warm or connected to people who are not like themselves. Uh, I, I, I imagine he will say that we've gone a long way toward a more uh, tranquil and cohesive society already. And uh, my, my intuitive feeling is that um, from that sort of subjective point of view, I, I'd be really surprised if COVID has really had much impact on that long-term uh, secular trend. I'd, I'd be really quite surprised. Um, so in that respect, I'm not uh, seeing thinking of COVID as a sort of major event. Where I think we do need to pay some attention, uh, to in, possibly to repeat uh, what I said a, a moment ago, is that there will be some objective changes that will have an impact on um, the relations between different, let's call them communities, population groups, because some things are going to be accelerated. We know that some industries which are on their way out, some aspects of manufacturing, some, some ways of uh, doing retail, these are the, the, the changes there are going to be accelerated massively. And um, some things that, will, that would have made a difference slowly are going to make a difference very quickly. Uh, and I think we need to think about that. Um, another a quick couple of other examples, which are, I'm speculating about, but I, uh, I, I think there's good evidence for it. If there is a retreat from the office and from the city centre, more um, working from home and all of, the, all of that, uh, we'll see sort of changes in the way that neighbourhoods work um, and so on. And I wonder if that will uh, re-emphasise the gradual drift, which has been taking place for 15, 20 years in residential segregation between white and not white. There is greater mixing between all the not white communities, but not greater mixing between whites and not whites. And I wonder if that could be an issue um, for us. Um, and that, by the way, would affect, uh, for example, the issues of the Northern Powerhouse, uh, whether there'll be more minorities working in the North or not, um, which is a big issue for a lot of the companies that we advise. And the other thing which I'm thinking, uh, I'm wondering about, is that we know where there will be great growth in the economy, or so I beg your pardon, the labour market, will be in caring and personal services. And uh, I wonder whether we need to be thinking about a society in which, I'm putting it really crudely here, there's a new phenomenon of older white people being cared for by younger brown people um, in really large numbers in a way that we haven't seen before and what that might mean culturally and politically. Um, so I think we need to think about those things really uh, going forward. I, I, I don't think that COVID is sort of gonna divide this country. The United States is a whole different story but here, I don't think that the United States, uh, that this country is going to be divided by COVID. But I think some of the after effects of COVID may have really severely differential impacts on different um, ethnic groups. Thank you. And um, would you like to go next? Go was that to me or to Maria? Uh, you, oh, sorry, I misheard. Um, yes, yeah, so um, we, we've been looking at this closely throughout throughout COVID, as, as Trevor says. Um, our findings are a, a, a bit different. They're a bit closer, Trevor, to what you were saying, really, than to what you imagined we might, we might be saying. So there was a very big pro-social surge, very, very sharp, uh, very early um, for short term. It was high trust in government, high trust in expertise, high trust in other people, um, wanting to do the right thing and so on, and, and people felt that happening. And obviously this all happened in the context of having had Brexit and general elections. And so to some extent, while it was an enormous and scary things, it was something of a relief from the politics that we've been having. And that, that was very strong. And then that's, that's fragmented quite a lot. And so we're broadly back 
to where we are. This country is an outlier on low trust in its government's handling with the United States. And that's very political now. Um, if you like the government, you voted for it, you'll still be on side. Otherwise, you're becoming more skeptical of it. And yet that, that social cohesion sense, um, people are almost slightly nostalgic now for early lockdown when we had a bit more of that going on. And that, that was distributed a bit differently as well. So um, the clapping was important. There aren't that many people who are skeptical about the clapping or think the clapping, you know, went on too long. The clapping was important because the clapping happened everywhere. Whereas the mutual aid groups and the knowing your neighbours better, a lot of people who've lived in a place for two or three years now have relationships with their neighbours they didn't have and are going to sustain those. But those have happened somewhat in more stable areas and in areas with more social trust to start with. And they've happened less in transient areas. So there is some danger that these pro-social interactions will in a way bond us closer to the people we already knew and the people who are near to us who we didn't know as well as we might, but actually still give us more them and us discussions about the other community 10 miles down the road. So there's an appetite to act on that and British Futures continues to work with the Together Coalition, uh, which um, is trying to work out what people want to do about this. There's a real appetite for more bridging, uh, doing more with other people, but people also don't quite know how you would do that beyond the hyperlocal and beyond the mutual aid group. So I think we need to act on that. And Trevor, of course, is right that that is all playing out in an, in an economic context that will get tougher and will reinforce existing divides. Thank you, Stenda. Maria, would you like to? Um, so I broadly agree that um, COVID probably will have very little long-term uh, impact on social cohesion without those kind of mediating uh, influences of what will happen to economy next, what will happen um, with other things. But one of the other things that I, I want to mention in addition of, uh, to economy is that um, the power of narratives that comes from the elites, from the newspapers, from the media, from the politicians themselves. And I think uh, COVID uh, did, as Suda already kind of alluded to, did suspend a lot of these very divisive narratives. And instead of uh, listening uh, constantly about the us and them, the pro-Brexit, the uh, Ramonas, all of those divisive narratives, all of a sudden we had the we are all in it together and you know we have now a very narrow focus of uh, surviving the pandemic and i think as that kind of wanes we are seeing a return to those more divisive narratives and i do wonder whether uh, this is something that the the government for example could reflect on um, and could start thinking about if there was an opportunity uh, to create that more inclusive narrative of we all in it together now that we are going to uh, face the economic fallout for example is this something that we want to consciously continue uh, pursuing or are we giving in into those more kind of short-term political um, narratives that deliver us uh, votes quicker and uh, media attention immediately uh, and can we afford to return to it or should we actually have a cohesive and long-term plan uh, to try to uh, formulate those bridging narratives that we, we know they can do. Thank you, Maria. Now, to our final question, I wanted to, to ask the panel, just thinking about the, the beyond the bit and thinking about the, the existing and continuing ethnic and race inequalities, for example, in employment or in the criminal justice system, um, which areas do you think are the most important ones to focus? and how should we go about it? Um, and we can start with Senda this time. I think the most important thing now about race inequality in Britain is that the pattern of um, opportunity, advantage and disadvantage has never been more complex. And so we need a debate and a policy agenda that reflect that complexity. And I think, I think we're missing that because I think both left and right have a narrative they want. I think the left has an excessively fatalistic narrative that nothing ever changes and so we talk about it but it's all the same, we don't need any more reviews. The left is not particularly attuned to what has changed. You know, big convergence in education, will it go through into employment and so on. And the right has a narrative that says, you know, the National Front were terrible, it's a great shame that happened, but onwards and upwards now we're practically a meritocracy we can't see what the issue is and isn't attuned to where our 
the boundaries. So I think again, it's not it's not just data. We've got very strong data in this country. It's 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 good, clear narratives about what that data shows us. Um, in a way, neutral voices being able to explain what we're looking at and what it means, and political voices able to do it. So I think we need a different race inequality debate at the bottom, in the middle, and at the top. And it tends to be that the left is very interested in a sort of story of marginalization and people being left behind. And that's still incredibly important in criminal justice, in prisons, in school exclusions, but isn't very important in how you respond to change. And actually more has changed than ever before. So I would focus on a couple of other issues. I think the, the, the evidence about CVs and your name affects whether you get an interview or not is an incredibly important debate if you see educational progress, but you see disparities in the workplace. And we know that hypothetical people are treated unfairly, but we now need to know what will institutions, law firms, businesses do to root that out and check if it's there. That seems a really important thing to focus on because of these rising expectations that might be disappointed. And then I also think you need to catalyze progress right at the top. I think we have a norm now of ethnic diversity in public life, particularly in politics. But actually, I don't think what we've got in national politics is reflected as well as it should be in the media and in the other spheres of cultural and political power, large civic society groups, cultural groups, are actually quite slow on this. So I'd like to see a sustained issue in each institution. What can we do? Where are we and what do we have to change? So as a symbolic thing, I would say no all white boardrooms by 2021 not just to put one person around the table who you know who you went to university with, but to say, what does this institution do about race equality in this institution and about good relations in our society? And, you know, lots of institutions, you know, every school governing body, every NHS trust can do significant things that are bespoke to them. So I think we've got to move away from a sort of hashtag of solidarity. You know, yes, we understand Black Lives Matter. Unfortunately, we don't really know any black people yet, but we'd love to find out how we can empathise to what are the responsibilities of this institution to do its bit for its values, which are, you know, equal opportunity, fairness, um, no discrimination. And I don't think this summer's debate has yet got us to that point from talk to action. That's why I'd like to see focus in government, but also outside government. And I think one of the, I think the big issues is about what is the action that a lot of institutions or organisations ask even if there is this kind of awareness and there's this even desire to, to increase diversity and, and, and representation sometimes I think and often the cast to us like what should we do so we know that works and I think um, it would be interesting also for you and the panelists to, to think about what are the concrete actions and I guess you suggested one about uh, not having all white uh, bush panels, for example. So just have one footnote to what I said, Antonio. I think you'll get a lot more conflict about this, and it might be a constructive mm -hmm. conflict, and it might be a destructive conflict, because Trevor's talking about, you know, the war on wokeness, and that could be dangerous. But essentially, you've probably got graduate intakes in a lot of liberal institutions that are not very diverse, graduate intakes that are a quarter uh, non-white or higher, and boardrooms that are sort of one sixteenth non-white, but feel that they're doing all the right things and it will get there in the end. So I think you see a clash there of expectations of it's more diverse than the 1990s versus it doesn't look fair to me. And I think I think there isn't yet a cultural confidence about how to, how to handle those clashes of expectations. I think as Maria says, you see a similar thing on gender expectations as you see on opportunities. So I think organizations are gonna have to work harder and step up more. Thank you, um, Trevor, would you like to answer? Yeah, uh, I sort of I agree with everything uh, Sandra said. I think, um, I particularly think, uh, you know, this slightly absurd thing: we don't need any more reviews. Well, you know, one of the things you, that we might want to consider is whether the millions of reviews we've had were any use, because quite a lot of them were completely useless and rubbish, um, and didn't engage with the actual problem based on crap data, etc. And you know, we can go through that. So I, I, I agree with him on pretty much everything he said. If you're asking about focus, I would also agree education and secondly employment. And I say that because I think, you know, what we constantly are thinking about uh, in this area is, is everything is down to the impact of discrimination. Well, the truth is actually in this country, again, let's separate ourselves from the United States. You've got to think to yourself, 
how do you how do you um, match the fact that on all of the subjective indicators about attitudes towards race and immigration all these issues we are a much more liberal country than we were even 10, 10 or 20 years ago yet the numbers in terms of promotion and retention and all those kinds of things uh, educational attainment so aren't shifting in the way that we would like for all groups so I think that um, we, we need to think us think about two things one is not all minorities are the same and secondly how is it that if attitudes have changed outcomes are not um, and I want to uh, I guess make a, a, a specific plea in this people are thinking about race equality stop separate we need to stop separating race inequality from everything else that's going on in the world so for example in the next five to six years transport will change dramatically uh, there will be driverless cars and so on well a quarter of pakistani muslim men are in the transport uh, business that's what they do that will have a bigger impact on that community than any amount of people who don't like Pakistani Muslim men. And yet we somehow separate these things and focus on you know, the odd bigot when actually there is this massive wave that will have more impact on the differentiation between that community and everybody else than anything else. And the other thing I would make in this, a point I'd make in this area, which is something that was completely ignored by everybody who pretty much does race equality. And that is the fact that, is that most race disadvantage does not uh, arise out of human agency. If you think right now, every issue, uh, every test, every hurdle, educational, uh, admission to higher education, jobs, uh, mortgage finance, insurance premiums, almost everything has at some stage in the process that any of us go through an automatic or an AI component. And one of the things we know for absolute certain is that that decision making is biased. Most of the time we don't know how, we don't know what to what extent, we don't know why it's happening. It is not about training data. It's not, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm a geek so I can bore on about this, but the point is we just don't know. And at the moment in law, nobody can be required to find out. So we know that uh, anybody who drives a car, who takes an insurance premium out, and they, if they live in a multiracial area, they will pay more than if they lived in an identical area that was not multiracial. Right now, there is no way of requiring insurance companies to uh, reveal the models or the algorithms, separate things, by the way, that, which they use. And there is no way of compelling them to interrogate their own data to see whether they are biased. They know for certain that that is the case, but they're not going to ask because if they produce proof, then they're in court and it's another PPI. And I would have said myself that this is the huge big gap in this area at the moment, that we are not even beginning to think about the impact of non-human interventions that are creating racial disparities. Maureen, would you like to? Yes, I couldn't agree more with everything that's been said so far. And I, I actually do agree that this issue of AI uh, discriminating and us not knowing what it's doing is a huge problem and definitely has to be one of the areas uh, that we investigate. Um, but uh, one of the areas of inequality that almost never gets listed, right? So we talk about employment and health and housing and never ever do we see politics included in that list. And um, I think it is partly because we look now at the cabinet uh, and it's diverse and we look at Westminster and it's diverse and the truth is that politics is not just what happens in London and um, this year for the first time ever in the history of this country uh, University of Manchester collected data on absolutely everybody in local government this has never been done uh, we have had samples where we looked at uh, London or the most diverse areas but um, the truth is that this is data that we don't collect and politics is riddled with these areas of pockets of power and control um, where 
people have these extremely uh, powerful positions to control outcomes and lives and could have the power to uh, intervene and question whether something's discriminatory or um, you know, interrogate areas of disadvantage. But these areas, we don't know how diverse they are. Uh, and we certainly don't have the same kind of pressure and attention on diversity of these uh, kind of positions of power that we do for Westminster. And we saw in from about 2010, uh, huge attention paid to local, uh, to, to national government and is it diverse? And that interrogation has led to immediate improvements uh, in diversity. Of, of national government. So we have to extend that. We have to extend that to local government that has huge um, kind of um, impact on people's lives, everyday's lives, uh, but also to political parties and other institutions. Uh, so not just boardrooms in, in kind of um, uh, in business, but boardrooms in um, public services, in uh, local government, in political bodies, uh, of various at various stages and localities, I think all of this is extremely important, and I think politics has to be on all these lists. Uh, and actually, AI here also offers us a, a good um, example of why would that be important. Obviously, obviously, it's legislation; it's the uh, legislative prerogatives uh, that we could see somebody legislating, um, including that in our equality uh, legislation as something that needs to be interrogated and who uh, will ever campaign for that, who will implement that if we don't have representation in politics. Thank you, Maria. Um, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, we, we really have time, but I think it would be good to have one or two uh, questions from the audience. Um, and I thought uh, Brunella uh, is asking, uh, what does research say are the most impactful initiatives for combating racial inequalities in the workplace? And I think this question is very relevant to some of the points you are making, both uh, the point that uh, Trevor made about, for example, the question of um, impacts any uh, drivers or, or working in transport about a quarter and, and the kind of how, if, if a lot of this is going to shift because of automation in the next few years, how do we make and the transition to, to other professions. And then the second kind of part of, I think, this question is also the aspects of discrimination that we know are probably the, the, the ones with most evidence in, in through the CV studies. And that, interestingly, and, and maybe this, your, your, your perspective of the panels, doesn't seem to have shifted that much over time. So, as Trevor mentioned, that attitudes have broadly improved towards diversity and migration. Um, the recent I think, meta analysis showed that uh, CV discrimination does, does not seem to have shifted dramatically. But so what can we do to tackle both more the kind of uh, structural issues around uh, different groups do different things and they won't be structurally impacted? And second, um, how do we combat active kind of violence uh, or even not active discrimination in the workplace? Um, Maria, you can pick up with your phone So, um, this is not really my area of, of expertise to kind of test what works in those kinds of um, employment areas, but just drawing at politics and the experience of politics, I do think institutional change is hugely important. Institutions can, and some of them do implement uh, simple changes uh, that, um, that make a huge difference. And one of the kind of obvious things is quotas. So, for example, if organizations have uh, shortlisting quotas where they uh, say if we have X percent of minorities applying for the job, we will guarantee that X percent uh, of minorities will be interviewed. And quotas often get dismissed uh, that they are unfair on other candidates who don't fall within those protected characteristics or that they are uh, they don't work or that they are patronizing even. But actually evidence from politics, uh, especially on gender, uh, but increasingly on ethnicity shows that they actually do work long term. Thank you. Um, Trevor? Well, I think that, uh, I mean, look, there, there are a million answers that one could give to this, but I, I'll try to give the, the simplest one um, at the moment. Um, I, I'm basically a, a, a transparency freak. Uh, my, my general view about corporate life, I mean, the company that I, um, or companies that I chair, we um, work for a lot of big companies, a lo lot of local authorities, public sectors, 
um, organizations and, and the truth of the matter is people that lead these organizations whoever they are and I, I, I don't at all um, demur from um, from Maria's point about representation and power but I think what in the end makes a difference is that if people want most people want to be able to tell a good story about the organization that they are in or they lead and uh, they want the information about their about their organization to reflect well on them um, at, in the past issues of diversity and race have been to some extent suppressed because people will say oh well we don't know we don't have the data we can't really tell you and so on i think the more transparent things have become the more people want to actually change the reality so that uh, they, when they tell the story about their organization or the story about their organization is revealed, it's a good one. So I'm a big, I'm incredibly keen on transparency. And if I had to have one key, it would be get as much data out there for customers, for clients, for citizens as possible about every organization because nobody wants to be at the bottom of any league table or to be the organization that people say, oh, that's the one that's never had a woman on the board or never had a person of color in the senior uh, levels. Um, and I think that's what makes a difference. What, what is not good, if I may, just because it's in my mind, I was in a meeting last night of an organization, a charity that I'm on the board of, where somebody used a really, I thought a really, killer expression and the young white woman said what we don't need is a lot more white guilt downloads we didn't really don't need to hear how much people care anymore let's just think about what we can do and i, I would say that is a really really fantastic uh, watchword i i agree with that because also i think the focus on uh, sort of white guilt um it's quite unhelpful. It takes you to very sort of um, emotional, behavioural things, but also it, it risks that you're trying to make progress in a way that amplifies the differences between groups. And you have coalitions to make progress on fairness when you have reduced distance between groups. Younger people have reduced distance between groups, and so they are allies. Older people feel more far apart. So I think, you know, while there might be a case also for quotas sometimes, um, if you can make progress without quotas, it, it's helpful because it, it doesn't give you that polarizing impact. I think there might be a job here for people like Behavioral Insights, really. A lot of people who would like to make progress don't know what to do about it. It's especially true, say, of civic society, NGOs, arts and culture organisations. We're sure we're trying to do all the right things. It hasn't worked yet, but we don't know. And there isn't really the simple toolkit of have you tried this and have you tried that, accessible information. But also, I think we need to find some large organisations that will take the risk of transparency and therefore do a bit more testing of our hypotheses. No doubt, I think health services could do it. I think the civil service could do it. How much difference does it have if the if the interviewing panel is all white or if it isn't, how much helps? What my sort of half-baked idea is, we've got these hypothetical tests. What would happen if, if you knew that a test like that was being run in a real round? Would you actually just pay a bit more attention, you know, on the blink test with the CVs? And would you be able to um, then, you know, on an anonymized basis, have a view as to whether your organization was as good as you thought? There's a real risk in obviously finding out you've got more work to do than you thought. So we've got to find out the incentives for organizations to take the risk of checking year by year. But I think with large processes, graduate milk rounds, civil service recruitment and so on, there's a chance actually to institutionalize the kind of, is it getting better or is it getting worse? And what happened when we made this intervention and then to share information with other organizations, it turns out that what makes a difference is X or Y. So at the moment, I think people don't have a, enough confidence in what the answers will be. And that's why, in a way, they do diversity training. Let's put everyone through diversity training because it's a something must be done, something can be done initiative without any evidence, really, of what the overall impacts of that, of that work are. Can I just yeah. quickly make a point about, I agree with that, and uh, I'm just responding to one of the, 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 the questions that's been asked. Um, uh, on the, quickly on, on, on the chat, on the Jahari window, uh, that is a complicated question, which uh, I think Sundas Sun partly responded to about people's, you know, under, understanding of their position relative to 
immigrants and so on. I, I think that's a rather complicated question. So Could you just not, repeat? Um, uh, well, yes. well, it's a, okay. The, the, there is a question which says, putting the issue under the context of the Jahari window, which is a, it's a context to do with one's relationship with those who are around you. Where, where can you situate the unknown attitudes toward immigrants by majority of the liberal minded whites in their relations with members of ethnic minorities and dealing with them at work as well as social relationships? Well, uh, I, I think I've said something about my attitude to do that in my last answer. But the, the point I just really wanted to make, somebody's asked about what is a narrative that I said earlier one was being suppressed. Um, it is correct in to the questioner, that some of it is to do with people in power not really wanting to know. It's less that they're terrible racists, it's just that they don't want to be bothered with this. It's just one more problem which they frankly can do without. But I would also say, bear in mind that a lot of the suppression of this comes from, um, if you like, the activist interest, which literally doesn't want to know anything that might interrupt their particular narrative of why there are different deficits or gaps. And uh, in the case of COVID, it was entirely because of pressure from activists groups who were worried, they said, about stigmatizing minority groups, that there was no early research. This was not because Public Health England initially didn't want to know. It was because they were made to be afraid of what they might find. Thank you. And unfortunately, I think we're running out of time. But, um, the, um, I completely agree with, I agree with a lot of the points that were said in relation to the, the, the actions and, and what can we do. And, and there's something that, as a great insight, seems to very much working on is how do we actually address this issue from an evidence based perspective? Because a lot of what's it's being done, it's, there's very little evidence, like Sunder said about kind of diversity training or unconscious bias training. In some cases, may actually backfire um, despite the best intentions. And so, Sort of evidence-based approach is one of the, the ways that we think is most, most promising if we actually want to drive change. Um, that's all we have time for. Apologies to all um, the attendants and their questions that we didn't have time to answer. To answer. But, um, um, that's, that's all we have. Thank you so much to Trevor, Maria and Senda for taking the time to be here and engage with this difficult but very important issues. And I will now say goodbye. Um, thank you very much.